جو آج کی تقریر کے مقرر ہیں اور سید جعوید اقبال کو جو ساؤتھ ایشیا میگزین کے روح روا ہیں اور جنہوں نے اپنی جریدے کی ایک ایک کوپی سب کو پیش کی ہے تو یہ موقع ہے this is the launch of جعوید جبار's book a general in particular Interactions with Parvez Musharraf, a political memoir. Let me say that this is only one of Javed Jabbar's numerous memoirs. He has written other memoirs also, which are linked with specific important political personalities. And, uh, and it is very significant, this particular memoir, because it contains the unreported Musharraf-Clinton dialogue of which Javed Jabbar Saab made an instinctive note. Uh, I don't think whether the others present knew that he was making those notes, but he has included them in this book. Clinton's uh, visit to Pakistan was a landmark visit in many ways. He was uh, against military dictators. He had an aversion to military leaders. But in any case, he came to Pakistan in March 2000. On his way back from India, where he spent many days, three or four days. According to Shaukat Aziz Sahab, who has written his own memoir, if I remember correctly, the real purpose of his visit was to save the life of Nawaz Sharif, who he thought could be sent to the gallows by President Musharraf. At that time, Musharraf was not president. He was chief executive. He became president much later. This book is significant, as I said, because it reports that dialogue between Clinton and Musharraf in what Javed has described as the restricted meeting in which there were very few people from either side, Pakistan and the United States. And the meeting ranged over many issues. Kashmir, nuclear non-proliferation, his own assessment of uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee, whom he said wanted to leave a legacy behind, a legacy of peace between India and Pakistan. Also violence against, along the LOC line of control, uh, Osama bin Laden's terror network, terrorism in general, the Taliban, the nuclear issue, which he said is a huge one for me. From the discussion between the two, it seemed that Clinton had read well into the history of Kashmir. But he did say that if Pakistan's attitude was Kashmir-centric, then we were heading towards a disaster. However, he said that he would not intervene on Kashmir. As I said, there was some emphasis in his dialogue with Musharraf on trying to save Nawaz Sharif's life. And he said, if Nawaz Sharif is executed, the cost will not match the benefits. Also said, I hope justice is done and he stays alive. And to which Musharraf replied, I am not a vindictive man and the court which is trying Nawaz Sharif is totally independent. Sharaf also said that he would not stay forever, but that he was there just to set the right direction, and so I have to be in there. About the Taliban, he said some very perspective things. The Taliban understand the power of money, but not force alone, he said. And uh, Clinton, uh, admonished him 
in his relations with India about Kashmir. Please remember that no country has ever parted with its territory. But as we all know, we parted with our territory in East Pakistan. Clinton's visit was, to the ordinary citizen, a great embarrassment. He came in his, uh, whatever, Air Force One, with his own limousine, and he drove on the right side of the road, as in the United States. And uh, I was a little uh, pleased that, uh, if it is true, Javed can bear, it, bear us out, that uh, President Tarar was a little late in receiving him, a few minutes late. But it was embarrassing because on that day, the whole country was on security alert. And Islamabad was completely shut down. Nothing moved on the roads of Islamabad that day. The schools, the colleges, the universities, the, I won't say the hospitals, but the bazaars, everything was shut down as he rode into the building where he and Musharraf met. It was also embarrassing that he was allowed to come on the national television and lecture to the people of Pakistan on the importance of democracy. I don't think that that would have happened in any other country, but it happened on ours. He came on the national TV and he lectured to us on how we were bad guys and how important democracy was. I was not part of the closed discussion meeting of which Javed was a part. But I remember the embarrassment. I was the cabinet secretary, but I was not invited, in spite of him, to the meeting which was arranged for members of the cabinet. Javed will no doubt tell you in his talk about his own initiatives to establish, to open up the media, to establish private TV channels and FM radios, and the role he played in pioneering the Freedom of Information Act. Let me say from memory that Musharraf showed the door to many people whom he appointed to important positions, both in the cabinet and otherwise. He showed them the door. And because I was cabinet secretary, they would ring me up before they departed to say goodbye. And they invariably gave the impression that they had resigned on principle. Although that was not really the case, they were sent home because their services were no longer needed. That is not to say that that is any reference to Javed Jabbar because I remember the cabinet meeting in which the, his differences with General Musharraf surfaced openly. And he was uh, very good about it. He said that since this is how you feel, General Musharraf, Mr. Chief Executive, then it means that you need a change. And I think that that was a very honest thing to do. So with these few words, I would hand over to Javed. I would say a few words to introduce him. Although he's so well known, he doesn't really need an introduction. He's an author, a writer, filmmaker. He likes to call himself a public intellectual and <laughs> filmmaker and also a philanthropist. He has done a lot of good work in Tharparkar. And most of all, he's a member of our institute. So over to you. Rahman Rahim, Dr. Masuma Hassan, thank you so much for being so gracious as to invite me and to suffer me and to introduce me and to say that uh, I, I don't call myself a public intellectual. Others have been mistaken enough to tag me. All I want to be known as is Shabnam Jabbar's husband, as others will testify. And there she is. 
and there are such fine faces around from childhood, from adulthood. I'm still in my childhood, but it's so nice to see all of you. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Masuma Hassan, this incredibly historic place which you have nurtured after your dear father founded this institution, the first think tank in Pakistan, and surviving, sustaining itself bravely and always uh, taking uh, up subjects that require analysis uh, from a wide perspective. It was a privilege to serve with uh, Dr. Masuma Hassan. Uh, she uh, was uh, able to cope with General Musharraf much better than I did. So she is an astute, I'm sure, manager of human relations. Um, mine was a friendship that became a workship uh, you know, not worship, Nauzubillah, Khudana Khasta, but a workship is very distinct from a friendship. But today, I want to start with the future rather than the past by inflicting on you some thoughts on the future of the Pakistan-United States relationship. And then I'll come to the Clinton uh, Musharraf dialogue, of which I was a participant. And then about my relationship with him, which is the least important. But when we talk about these two countries, just so that, for the record, we know what we are talking about. We are talking about two very, very different countries. One country with an economy estimated to be minimum $21 trillion. 21 trillion, the largest economy in the world. Ours, if you measure it, uh, whatever measure you apply, 1.2 trillion dollars. If you want to convert it, oh, 26, 27 probably is more likely the size of the U.S. economy. Real GDP per capita, 65,000 dollars, as opposed to our 5,200 dollars. Oh, what a difference, what a difference. That very peaceful segment called the military, the U.S. spends only $800 billion a year. $800 billion. That's about twice the size or more of just our annual uh, GDP or whatever. And uh, it has only 800 military bases around the world of different kinds, whether it is the large base in Qatar or ships in Bahrain or wherever, 800 bases. We have no base. In patents and technology, world leader, the United States, incredible country, uh, super artificial intelligence, apart from artificial intelligence, SAI is now on the anvil of transforming, transforming humanity's interhuman relations. You now machines are talking to machines. The human is becoming a machine with that thing that we carry around in our pocket. And the machine is becoming humanized. And most of it due to the innovations that America is introducing. And in terms of population, they're also ahead, 340 to 350 million people. We are 230, but mashallah, we are growing much faster than they are. So they better watch out. We might overtake them in the next 50 to 100 years. Also in location, we are very different. Here is a country uh, with two oceans uh, bounding it. Uh, no hostile immediate neighbor, not Canada, not Mexico. At the most, one could say Alaska brushes the shoulder of Russia, uh, but that is not the same as what Pakistan faces with two very, very hostile neighbors. Perhaps very, very does not apply to Afghanistan as much as it does to India, which has systematically, uh, successfully, uh, invaded our territory, uh, which we did not just give up. We were defending our territory in 1971. 
and we made the catastrophic error of not even filing a formal complaint with the UN Security Council on the 22nd of November. We, for some bizarre reason, we did not file a formal complaint when another country invaded our territory. We just addressed a letter to the UN Secretary General. Oh. But we are located at a very, very important geostrategic part of the Earth. The Gulf, Iran, Afghanistan, India, China, Russia. So we have hostile neighbors, but we also have not so hostile neighbors across the Gulf. So two very dissimilar countries. The first factor I think that everyone is conscious of, but we need to remember it, that our relationship will always be in the foreseeable future, a relationship of inequality, a bilateral relationship in which the two are not equal. But that then applies to virtually every other country of the world. The United States is so far ahead of other countries in terms of economy, in terms of the military, that no country today, even China, uh, is not able to say that we are going to be able to match the US in every respect. So if that is a given that every other country on the planet will have an unequal relationship with the United States, the challenge for Pakistan becomes how do we manage that inequality? Uh, it is not as if it is a hopeless situation. Other countries, uh, also beset with this inequality, have shown that they can manage inequality in a way that works for them. Take Vietnam, less than 100, peop 100 million people, but look at the dynamism of its economy. It's fought a traumatic war with the United States and is now one of the major exporters to the United States. And tries to stay away from any geopolitical entanglements. Uh, uh, it's a remarkable feat of managing. But also China. China has strong economic links with the United States, uh, manages that, but also manages the, or is not able to manage the diplomatic military relationship. That's too, ex too extreme. So the first challenge is, Pakistan's diplomacy, Pakistan's polity. Uh, diplomacy is just an extension of internal politics. Uh, the capacity to manage this inequality. But there are also uh, symmetries. I mean, if there is asymmetry in so many respects, there is at least in the United Nations General Assembly, we are two equal nation states, whether that matters or doesn't because the UN Security Council and the five veto members negate the principle of equality on the claim that they actually uh, help stabilize a very volatile world and which is partly true. But there is also symmetry in the fact that the US and Pakistan are one of only nine nuclear powers in the world. And that's not to be disregarded. Out of 200 nation states, only nine, one of them an undeclared power, Israel. One of them a Parea state, North Korea. But we are a state that is in dialogue with the United States. We are not North Korea. And we are not the beneficiary of patronage by the United States as Israel is and is able to de not declare that it is a nuclear power. So our nuclear weapon status does give us a semblance of symmetry with the United States. Even though we have no delivery capacity, uh, we can't deliver a nuclear weapon, God forbid, if the need arises to the United States. They can deliver it to us. The third element which disturbs one is the de facto acceptance of US imposed sanctions as an instrument of global policy and interstate relations. In the United Nations Charter, Article 39 vests this power with the United Nations Security Council. The UNSC has the power to impose sanctions. 
but because of the preponderance of the United States and the acceptance by its NATO allies who are conniving with it and non-NATO countries, the U.S. because of its command of the economic system, 60-65% of all dollar transactions in the world today on a daily basis have to be cleared from New York. Dr. Ishat Hussain will correct me uh, where I'm wrong in that estimate. But with that power has come this ability to impose sanctions. And this is a very disturbing factor. And how is Pakistan going to cope with it? We can't ignore it because two of our immediate neighbors, Afghanistan and Iran, are today the victims of U.S. sanctions, not UNSC. UNSC sanctions are another matter, but UN sanctions and UN, uh, U.S. sanctions. And U.S. sanctions in the past have been used to starve children of medicines in Iraq uh, purely because the U.S. wanted to find weapons of mass destruction which never came about. So this has given the global order a new potency and it undermines the very system that the U.S. helped create. The U.S. is not entirely a villain. We have to acknowledge that after the Second World War, the construction of the United Nations for the first time as a structure within which diverse nations could coexist is a major contribution. And it reflects its uh, partly its uh, genuine, perhaps, sincerity in trying to create a stable world. But uh, the use of sanctions and the arbitrariness, the arbitrariness and the uh, selectivity with which the U.S. acts undermines the very same rules-based order which it keeps talking about. You see, we should respect the rules-based order but whenever it suits the United States, the rules-based order goes out of the window. At the same time, we are, Pakistan, with all our grievances, are the largest recipients, beneficiaries of the U.S. Fulbright program. Quite remarkable. It is not India, it is not Turkey, it is not Malaysia or Indonesia, Pakistan. Pakistan is the biggest beneficiary of the Fulbright program, which for 30, 40, 50 years, hundreds and thousands of Pakistani scholars have benefited by studying in very, uh, very outstanding universities in the U.S. So that is an irony. And then, of course, uh, to be fair, the economic aid, physical infrastructure aid, construction of roads, electrification, other physical infrastructure support has really helped Pakistan. Uh, often it has been in the form of grants rather than uh, high interest loans. So that factor we need to preserve. How do we continue to benefit uh, while managing the other sensitivities of the relationship. The fifth factor, perhaps, will be that it cannot be a bilateral relationship. In theory, two nations can have a bilateral relationship. And even a decoupled relationship, I mean, we don't, they don't want India to figure as a factor in the U.S.-Pakistan relationship. And we accept that. Uh, but actually, there cannot be a purest bilateral relationship. Because the US relationship with India will have a direct bearing on Pakistan's relationship with the United States. The US relationship with Afghanistan will have a direct impact on Pakistan. And even the US relationship with Iran even though Iran has not figured as much as Afghanistan and India have, uh, that also will impact us, if not now, in the future. And it already impacts us. 
the non-construction of the Pakistan section of the gas pap pipeline, uh, which we were supposed to build years ago, has not been done because of the fear of U.S. sanctions. And we are now facing the prospect of an $18 billion fine that Pakistan may have to pay to Iran for non-fulfillment of the agreement. So there is no such thing as a purest bilateral relationship with the United States. It's a quadrilateral, at least. And I haven't even begun to mention China. The US-China relationship will have a direct impact on Pakistan's relationship with the United States. Uh, as best as we can manage, uh, and so far we managed it very well. And I'm proud of Pakistan's uh, diplomatic record that from the inception we have shown an exceptional capability to manage very difficult relationships. We underestimate that. We tend to think of us as, you know, oh, Uncle Sam dictates everything in Pakistan. No, not so. In the late 50s, early 60s, when uh, communist China was besieged, it was Pakistan that had the courage to reach out, to make Beijing part of international travel facilities by asking PIA to open a flight. While we were at the same time members of an anti-communist coalition known as CENTO, and Seattle, and we were managing both. And later, I mean, uh, the tribute paid to Pakistan, yes, it was a single episode, but it showed decades or years it was conditional. They did look the other way when we were helping them in Afghanistan. Uh, Reagan consciously decided to look the other way and let us get on with our plans. But soon after Reagan, the sanctions returned. And George Bush, George H.W. Uh, Bush brought it back, whether it's Symington or Pressler Amendment or what have you. But we did manage it, and we have the capacity to do so in the future as well. Ah. Which brings to mind the other uh, challenge we are facing. The insecurity of big states. It's a phenomenon that one happened to write about, I think only about 21 years ago, 22 years ago in dawn, after the 9-11. I felt this was a strange uh, phenomenon of global politics that the bigger the state, the more insecure it becomes. In theory, it should be the small states of the world that should suffer from insecurity. But uh, the way the US reacted to 9-11, yes, it was an outrageous act, it should not have happened, uh, indicated this as a factor which we see next door in India. India, the predator state of South Asia, what is the threat that India faces? Now, of course, China has been built up as a great threat to India. Uh, they've positioned three strike cores permanently against Pakistan. Pakistan, outnumbered. The only equalizer is our nuclear uh, factor. Uh, but how insecure India is, my God. Look at how they crept into Siachin, violating the agreement of uh, the Simla agreement, where there was not supposed to be any change in the LOC, demarcated or marketed or marked. And what we did in Kargil was simply settling the score for Siachin. And of course, we handled it so badly, we got maligned across the world as if we had broken the Simla agreement, whereas India had actually been the predator, which is always expanding across. And perhaps the last factor that we have to deal with when we look at Pakistan-US relations is going to be the role of the military. The role of the military in Pakistan is very obvious, it's clear. 
it has a major role in internal affairs and it has a very major role in external affairs. Uh, not so in the United States, partly. Uh, because the US military certainly plays a key role uh, in foreign policy, uh, in relations which uh, affect nuclear weapons or relations with China or relations with, the, uh, with Russia or with non-NATO adversaries. Uh, the US military is a very powerful force and domestically, as President Eisenhower said it memorably in the 1950s, he cautioned his own citizens about the dangers of the military-industrial complex in the United States, which is a potent factor that influences policy. So these would be, perhaps with that I should tag the fact, this undue obsession in the United States about the fear that the nuclear weapons of Pakistan are going to fall into the hands of extremists. Uh, utterly overblown, unrealistic, unfair, dishonest exaggeration. Uh, we may be very bad at civil governance, but whoever knows anything about how our system operates uh, can be quite confident that the Strategic Plans Division, along with GHQ, have taken measures and the Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission's non-peaceful uh, nuclear part. I remember when Dr. Masuma Hassan convened a conference, an international conference, uh, this year, of course, last year, but the one before that. The former director of safety at the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna, uh, said it publicly in Pakistan at the PC Hotel. She said, I wonder why Pakistan does not do more to inform and educate the world about its extraordinarily high standard of safety of nuclear installations. What a tribute. She said, Pakistan is not behind any other country. And that is a reflection, a contradiction of this paranoia that the United States cultivates in order to justify uh, measures that it takes vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. So we need to work on these. And uh, while we are doing that, the most important factor that will shape is how we set the rot right within ourselves. Uh, we cannot blame the U.S., we cannot blame India, uh, we cannot even blame GHQ entirely. It is a collective effort that we need to make as a country to transform ourselves. The rot that we have allowed to fester is not just because Uncle Sam has forced us into the hands of IMF. <laughs> we pay no federal direct income tax on agriculture out of 100 thousand private firms, 30, 40,000 private firms don't even file their tax returns. Highly educated doctors and lawyers in Karachi don't receive checks. They want hard cash. Here we are cheating ourselves and saying the IMF, IMF. We have all the wealth right here in our country which can easily take care of our needs. So the rot has to be set right by us, not by the US. And by doing it, we should stop supplicating ourselves before the United States. Uh, three weeks ago, I was in a private gathering at the home of someone who shall remain unnamed, a meeting with the US ambassador supposed to be off the record. So this will probably have to be off the record. Not, oh boy, it's being recorded. I don't mind saying it. What horrified me is the way the host welcomed the US ambassador and how that was followed by the head of an economic forum of Pakistan who also addressed the U.S. ambassador as if the U.S. ambassador was the chief justice of Pakistan. Heart-rending appeals 
to bring order into the chaos created by the political parties, by the civil military divide, by the diving rupee. My God, I couldn't take it. I'm supposed to be well versed in diplomacy. I've had the honor of representing Pakistan in diplomatic capacities at the UN. So I had to butt in and I said, sorry, I've come here to listen to the US ambassador tell us about the imminent destabilization of the United States. We know what's rotten with Pakistan. Why are you asking the US ambassador to tell us what to do? We know what has to be done. We should learn from him how is he going to manage a Republican House in a Democratic Senate? How is US policy going to become coherent? How are you attacking the abortion issue? How are you attacking this issue? Okay. So this demeaning ourselves and losing self-respect and self-confidence is one of the worst things that we can do to ourselves when we are dealing with the United States. We, must, we are nowhere near as powerful as the US. No, no, we are not. But we are human beings and we are very capable. We've got tremendous potential in this country. So. I hope that happens, and I'm not saying this only to show what a shameless patriot I am, but only to suggest that there is so much good within Pakistan. I'll move now to the Clinton-Musharraf dialogue. Before he came, when Musharraf consulted about five people, I was the odd man out, the joker in the pack, because I was the only one who opposed his visit because of the outrageous conditions that had been conveyed by the US ambassador, William Milam. No photographs, eight hours, address the nation. I said, what is this? I mean, this is so insulting. So I've written it in the book, but I knew I was going to be overruled and I'm glad I was overruled, but at least I put my uh, impractical views on the record. Remember that five days before he arrives, uh, there takes place that false flag operation, typical raw operation. Chittin, Chittin, Chittin Gar, Anant Nag district, Indian occupied Kashmir. Some characters turn up dressed in uniforms and massacre 35 Sikhs. <laughs> meant to subvert Clinton's visit to Pakistan. Thank God Clinton knew better and he didn't change his schedule. Uh, but that only uh, reinforced the fact that uh, Clinton took Pakistan and meeting Musharraf much more seriously than perhaps, perhaps even Musharraf did. Because sadly, when I read the book written by Clinton, his own autobiography, which is called My Life, published four years after this dialogue. Clinton devotes appropriate references to his meeting with Musharraf. And what does my dear General Musharraf do? His autobiography comes two years later, 2006, in the line of fire. And there are barely two references to Bill Clinton. There is no reference whatsoever to this first meeting with the U.S. president, which was a historic meeting. He was at that time not even elected. He was a military ruler. But there's not a single word in, in the line of fire about that meeting. What an oversight, both by General Musharraf and by his ghostwriter, whose identity is known to some people but the buck stops with General Musharraf because he should have made sure. In contrast, in contrast, uh, Bill Clinton says this, and I want to share this with you, because, sorry, yeah. This is what Bill Clinton writes on page 900 of his book. He says, and I quote, the Secret Service was strongly opposed to my going to Pakistan or Bangladesh because the CIA 
had intelligence that indicated Al-Qaeda wanted to attack me on one of those stops, either on the ground or during takeoffs or landings. I felt I had to go because of the adverse consequences to American interests of going only to India and because I didn't want to give in to a terrorist threat. So we took sensible precautions and proceeded. I believe it was the only request, this is so important, in eight years, I believe it was the only request the Secret Service ever made that I refused. So to the credit of Clinton, in the opposition of his own uh, uh, most uh, vital uh, agency, he overruled it in order to come to Pakistan. So that made the conditionality of his visit a little less palatable. But of course, we got to know that later. And then, and then on page uh, 109, page 109, This only strengthens the case for each of you to buy a copy of my book, eh? Instead of waiting for me to read it out. Some have already misguidedly done it. Now look at what he says, page 903 of his book, My Life by President Clinton. And he devotes two paragraphs to Musharraf. He says, and I quote, In my meetings with Musharraf, I saw why he had emerged from the complex often violent culture of Pakistani politics. He was clearly intelligent, strong, and sophisticated. If he chose to pursue a peaceful, progressive path, I thought he had a fair chance to succeed. But I told him, I thought terrorism would eventually destroy Pakistan from within if he didn't move against it. Musharraf said he didn't believe Sharif would be executed, but he was non-committal on the other issues. I knew he was still trying to solidify his position as, and was in a tough spot. Sharif subsequently was released into exile in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, when Musharraf began serious cooperation with the United States in the war against terror after 9-11. It remained a risky course for him. In 2003, he survived two assassination attempts within days of each other." Unquote. So my submission is that uh, Clinton took the meetings with Musharraf perhaps in a sense more seriously than Musharraf did retrospectively. But for the dialogue itself, as the book will reveal, Musharraf began in a very tentative way uh, because he knew he was at a great disadvantage having accepted the conditions. But he very quickly acquired confidence as he spoke. And he remained very candid. And Clinton was also very stiff in the initial part. But lo and behold, within 15 minutes of the process, Clinton actually started to relax and smile. And the meeting proceeded towards cordiality rather than tension. We reached 35 minutes, which was the time allotted for the dialogue. When we went to 45, Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State, passed a little chit to President Clinton. And we were seated very close to each other so I could see who was doing what. So Clinton looked at it and carried on. We went into 60 minutes, conversation flowing very smoothly, even chuckles taking place, Clinton laughing at points. Oh, I could see the concern rising in the aides. Was it right for the US president to relax with a military dictator? We've only had 35 minutes on the timetable and we are now 60 minutes. What signal are you si giving out? Is this what must have been going through their mind? Second chit followed from John Podesta, Chief of Staff. 
Clinton looked at it and kept it aside. Kept going. MashaAllah. The charm of Pakistan. Eh, na? Charm of Pakistan. <laughs> Engrossed in his dialogue with Musharraf. And it actually lasted for 85 minutes. And uh, as the content of the dialogue will show, and as Dr. Masuma Hassan has rightly pointed out, it covered virtually all the main points. And uh, there was a sense of goodwill coming through from Clinton, uh, which was comforting to know, considering the arrogance which also marked the visit. And even in the after that 85 minutes, the two leaders wanted an exclusive one-on-one -on -one, uh, dialogue. And on that, obviously, I, I did not ever ask Musharraf what went on. But I suspect, and I've listed eight points there, that they must, he must have conveyed to him in person, obviously, the need to avoid uh, the uh, death sentence or execution of Nawaz Sharif. And he must have kept in mind the fact that not too long ago, a US President Carter had appealed to General Ziaul Haq not to execute Zedeh Bhutto. And that general had ignored a US President, had ignored virtually all other leaders who had appealed for Zedeh Bhutto's life. So it's perfectly understandable Clinton uh, wanting assurance from Musharraf, which I am positive he gave in that one-on-one -on -one basis, because Musharraf, from what we know of him, and there are gentlemen here, Sayyid Javed Iqbal, Dr. Dr. Ishrat Hussain, who have, uh, Javed um, was also a friend of his, Dr. Ishrat and I worked in the same cabinet as Dr. Masuma did. Uh, Musharraf did not ever have the temperament of being a cold-blooded, callous, a kind of uh, killer. Uh, he was not built that way. His psyche was not of that kind. So you will find the dialogue as one example of what happened. I'll just now conclude with some reflections on the workship with Musharraf, which began well enough as uh, he asked me to be advisor to him with the status of a federal minister. For some reason, he didn't want me to become a minister right away, be an advisor. And uh, we got along very well initially. Uh, there was the hijacking of the Indian aircraft to Kandahar in the last week of December, which created a whole crisis, how to manage it, because Pakistan was directly accused of having a hand in it. And Masood Azhar was released and sent into Pakistan that further uh, you know, consolidated the conviction that Pakistan or Pakistan's secret agencies had a hand in that hijacking. But we came through and then was the episode with the judiciary in January when, uh, to their credit, seven judges of the Supreme Court and uh, did not agree to take a second oath specified by General Musharraf. Uh, and he survived that as well and uh, proceeded to announce several very, very constructive, positive reforms. Virtually all of them have endured today, till today. No elected civil government before him had ever thought of those reforms. And the credit should go to him because ultimately he uh, promulgated the ordinances. I may have suggested the introduction of independent media, but it is his decision to use his prerogative as chief executive to actually pass the law. So let me just list some. It was General Musharraf who reduced the voting age from 21 to 18 years, which was a major step. It, enf it enfranchised millions of young women and men for the first time in Pakistan's history. Second, he brought back the joint electorate. And in a way, non-Muslims have two votes. Non-Muslims can now contest on general seats and vote for general seats. As a result, in 2018, three non-Muslim Hindu candidates defeated three Muslim candidates 
in Jamshoro, Mirpur, Khas, and Tharparkar. And only in Tharparkar, 48% population is Hindu. Uh, but Jamshoro, Mirpur, Khas do not have Hindu majorities. And yet, Muslims voted for Hindu candidates. And at the same time, non-Muslims can vote for their own representatives on reserved seats. So this is a remarkable feature of Pakistan's electoral system introduced during Musharraf's time. Third, he actually strengthened the Election Commission of Pakistan. I was with him on that visit when the Election Commission said we can't shift one rupee from this head to another head until the Ministry of Finance approves this reallocation. He immediately on the spot ordered that the Ministry of Finance will have nothing to do with what the Election Commission of Pakistan does with its own budget. A major step. Fourth, juvenile justice. For the first time, the age of a child was defined comprehensively as being 18 years. Otherwise, it was 15 somewhere, 16 somewhere. And conditions made it mandatory not to allow child prisoners to be kept with adult criminal prisoners. Fifth, an entirely new local government system actually empowering the Nazim with equivalent powers historically to that of a deputy commissioner. But that had never happened before elected official being able to decide on the spot issues related to health, education, administration, what have you. Sixth, increased uh, reserved seats for women. 33% uh, in all local government tiers. My God, a revolutionary change. 33% meant that in the local bodies polls of 2000 and 2002, held in stages, about 40,000 women were elected to union councils, uh, tehsil councils, and district councils for the first time in Pakistan's history. Ironically, during Shokat, uh, Shokat's uh, time, uh, dear Prime Shokat Aziz's time, there was some tinkering done and those seats were reduced on very weird pretexts and the others are not interested, governments that have come after that. We already know about the introduction of private independent electronic media. The creation of the National Academy of Performing Arts in Karachi and other cultural institutions, empowering them, giving them federal funding support. Alas, except for those five weeks where he made the catastrophic mistake of imposing an emergency. Media in Pakistan enjoyed unprecedented freedom to criticize him, to criticize the government. No restrictions on electronic media and in print media. It was only in those five weeks from November to December that this restriction was placed and it was finally pulled back. In the 2002 general elections, no attempt to rig the polls. He was a military ruler who could have rigged it. What were the results? The highest votes secured in the October 2002 polls were by the opposition, Pakistan People's Party. Then third, and finally, to make Zafrullah Jamali his hand-picked man as Prime Minister, the military ruler could only manage a one-vote majority. One vote! I mean, most military dictators would make sure they get a thunderous majority. So, those are the things that I think we need to remember him. But, but I will conclude with the negatives the inception of missing persons and enforced disappearances as part of the war on terror, especially including Balochistan, but not exclusively Balochistan. Uh, virtually unhindered cooperation with the U.S. in the war on terror. Insensitive handling of the Nawab Akbar Bukti episode, showing a fist 
and saying, we'll teach you a lesson. That is the most inappropriate posture to adopt. And that whole attempt to besiege or to capture Nawab Bukti was misrepresented in media as if it was a callous attempt to kill him. Whereas it was not the intention of General Musharraf to actually assassinate or kill Bukti, who died in that collapse of the cave. And that episode then alienated so many people in Balochistan. The Lal Masjid episode, allowing those rascals to sit in that masjid and build it up. The referendum, which was such a mockery, he had the good grace to apologize for the uh, very fraudulent results. Sixth, the insistence on contesting for the presidency while wearing his army uniform. I mean, I also thought it was so outrageous. I signed an open letter along with General Moin Heather, General Tanvir Nakhvi and others who had served in the cabinet. He was very upset with us, but we felt he, was, he had stopped listening. The dismissal of Iftikhar Chaudhary, done in that ham-fisted way, with cameras, with army uniforms, sitting there telling a chief justice, at the suggestion of Shaukat Aziz, of course. The imposition of the emergency, that beautiful three-letter word, NRO, and the political alignments. Right, now I conclude. It was great to get to know Parvez Musharraf. Ironically, since he became uh, chief executive on a PIA flight, as a result of a PIA flight, my first meeting with him was on a PIA flight, uh, where he introduced himself in 1994. We were seated next to each other. He recognized me, I didn't. He was DGMO, and that began a remarkably close relationship built over five years, and we got along very well. And just before he left for Sri Lanka, I left for Washington, D.C., we said we'll get together again very soon after he comes back. Little did I know, I get a phone call from him in Washington, D.C., after he calls up Shabnam to say, where is Javed? After he takes charge. And that was his first phone call. So I rush back and then I join him. And then begins the up and down of our relationship. And I discover that power, alas, can change human beings. And that's what happened. And I'm not setting myself up as a superior person. I have many flaws. Living witness, Shabnam Jabbar, will come and speak about my flaws. <laughs> but uh, but power, power changed General Musharraf. Sometimes for the better, but also for the worse. And I wish that he had quit uh, in three years, the time that the Supreme Court had given him. Uh, I've written about that in the latest issue of South Asia. This gentleman, Sayyid Javed Iqbal, is so hospitable. He is willing to publish anything you give him. But I mean, provided it's uh, pr properly written, I hope. But in this, in this, I have speculated. I have taken the liberty of imagining what would have happened if he had taken my humble advice, which is also reproduced in the book, had stepped away after the three years given to him in the Supreme Court, spent two years mandatorily, you can't go into politics after being a government official, and come back with that kind of track record, all the reforms that he had already introduced in the first one year and the first three years, I think he would have been welcomed back as a refreshing alternative to the dynastic, corrupt uh, leadership of parties. But that is a what's if. May his soul rest in peace. I think he was a, a very notable individual who, did, who meant well for the country. And uh, I hope you suffer reading the book. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, before I invite questions, I want to make a clarification. When I said we uh, gave up uh, East Pakistan, I didn't mean that we gave it up without a fight. Our soldiers fought very valiantly, and that was also acknowledged 
by no other than General, later Field Marshal, Sam Manikshaw, who was uh, the victor against, uh, against us on behalf of India. He said that the Pakistanis fought very valiantly. What I meant was that he, what I meant was that it was a political failure. East Pakistan was a political failure on our, on our part, Quite. what happened in East Pakistan. The other thing I'd like to say is that many people advised General Musharraf to go home after his three years. Uh, Javed must have done it surely, as he said he did, but many other people did. Even from within his own constituency, there were people who told him that, all right, the time is up and you should go. He had asked for five years from the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, you know, validated every martial law in the country. So they willingly gave him three years, provided he did, did not change the structure of the system, of the political system. Any questions? Assalamu alaikum. Javed, I see you puchna chariyu. Why do you think Bill Clinton continued beyond 35 minutes? What was the reason that he went on to 8 to 5? What made him do that? Thank you, uh, uh, Sahiba. I think two things. Number one, Pakistan as a country and the complexity of our issues, he clearly felt were not covered in the 35 minutes that were originally allotted to him. Second, perhaps equally important, was the manner of General Musharraf in how he engaged with Clinton. Uh, that, I think, struck a chord with him. And one could tell immediately that Clinton was responding uh, very empathetically to the manner that General Musharraf had. I mean, there was no compunction about the fact that he is a military ruler. Of course, a military ruler who was the first not to declare martial law. We must remember this anomaly, even though it could be said, by what is the difference? After all, a military ruler was a military ruler, but... There were no martial uh, law courts. Exactly. There were no martial law courts. It was a very big difference, and I think that was appreciated by him. And also, uh, the freedom, the freedom of expression, already that existed in the first five, six months. Uh, there was open criticism of uh, uh, General Musharraf. I think that also uh, helped Clinton decide that it's worth continuing this dialogue. And remember that there was no other intervention. There were five people, uh, six people on that side, six on this side. No one else spoke. It was just a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. And uh, clearly, uh, one engaged the other, and as you will see in the content which I have reproduced, uh, that the thaw took place quite e early and remained like that, and very candid, very candid. Uh, Mr. Jai a very eloquent speech right. from your side. Right. Actually, I interviewed uh, Parvez Musharraf six years ago in Dubai, and I had a one-hour and one, uh, one hour interview with him. We discussed many things, but when the interview was over, I asked one thing. He said, okay, whatever you're going to ask me after the interview, you will not publish it either in the print or in, in the, in the, you know, in uh, television. So I asked him, okay, really you wanted to hang Mr. Nawaz Sharif? Can lage? Tumhari zain mein ye baat kaise hai? Main ka ke most of the people in the left, they are asking you actually to hang him because he was the person who was pursuing General Zia to hang Bhutto. So I said, I have heard that the Bhutto Sahib had a lot of hands on the Bhutto Sahib. So this was the reason that why I also, somebody said that you hang him. So I said, in my mind, there was no such thought that after the interview, he will not be able to hang him. I never wanted to hang him. And this is not the case. Because I was very clear that he will not be able to hang him. And he said, you 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 hang him. You didn't interview, I interviewed him for one hour. Javed knows that when I went to Dubai. So I, I don't think uh, Mr. Musharraf ever thought of uh, hanging him, first thing. Uh, second, second question is, you were, you were speaking about the Pak-United States relations. 
and you are very intelligent person but you didn't say the future what is the future of pak pakistan and and uh, united states relations do you think do you think honestly that the public actually doesn't enjoy a good relation public think that america is responsible for all the ills in pakistan do you subscribe this view or you have some other opinion thank you ji uh, thank you i thought i identified about six factors which i think will shape Uh, Pakistan US relations I can't predict what they will be uh, no one can uh, I should have also mentioned there is a seventh called the black swan the black swan means something that happens which no one anticipated 911 is a black swan and there have been black swans in history so something can happen which can be very beneficial for Pakistan uh, something may not happen but those six factors are Uh, i don't think it is fair to ascribe all that is wrong in pakistan to the united states no only part of the problem could be ascribed to our dependence on the united states but i don't think we should pass the buck to the us we must ourselves take responsibility for what we are we went to them within days weeks of becoming an independent state and we asked for aid very large amount of aid at that time 1947 we didn't get what we wanted but that was an indicator of our dependence syndrome perhaps understandable because we came into uh, into independence with such enormous disadvantages uh, deliberately inflicted on us we thought the us would help us they helped us but only marginally no so short answer no the us is not responsible partly uh, perhaps only partly we are primarily responsible thank you for this very interesting set of remarks i i have two questions one is when the general shaw called you up uh, to ask you to become part of this cabinet Did you have any compunction at all about serving under a military dictator? And second, uh, I understand you resigned in 2000. So what was the, the reason for resigning? There is a fortunately I have unloaded uh, my uh, in a uh, in a turbulence. Uh, there is a chapter called Waiting and Ruminating, which partly addresses this very issue. I did have this dilemma. that otherwise i had opposed general ziaul haq in the senate i had moved motions against him i had opposed the dismissal of junejo uh, i had moved privilege motions which is very rare in the senate you can't get a privilege motion through but it had almost come through and to the extent that dear general ziaul haq uh, had heard me spew I had issued all against him earlier that day when he was hosting a dinner for senators in July 1988. So I went straight from hurling all kinds of political invective against him straight to his door, and he greets me there and says, "Yeah, we are very happy to be here." This was carried to the chief of the Yahoo Club to try and disarm one. So I said, "Well, thank you very much, General." So. no it was a dilemma however there is always a however however uh, one felt that at that given time we have we were facing the prospect of an elected despot an elected despot also wanting to become amirul mu'minin and taking decisions which were bizarre in the extreme bizarre decisions flying off to meet clinton without consulting his foreign minister without consulting his foreign secretary without consulting the chief of army staff he calls musharraf to the airport and says i'm about to leave shall we ask for a cease fire and musharraf said we are not we are not vulnerable for a cease fire why are we you know but he was overruled so that was one decision but earlier he had also asked general karamat such a soft spoken well meaning chief of army staff who would never have intervened militarily he asks him for his resignation just because general karamat speaks 
at a forum in the Naval War College saying that in the interest of stability, there should be a National Security Council. So an elected despot can be as uh, dangerous for a country as an unelected military ruler. And finally, I suppose it was selfishness on my part, the lure of becoming a, a federal minister for a third time and scoring a hat trick and having it on my resume and showing off to school friends like Zafar Ahmad Khan, <laughs> preening oneself and looking at oneself in the mirror and saying, wow, bete tum bhi ban gaye So there was, I'm sure, this terrible thing called the ego in it, but also, I was motivated by the possibility that with that kind of authority that he had, we could implement reforms that would not have been possible. Because again, and this is not said uh, from the self point of view, three years earlier in the caretaker government, one had presented the law for independent electronic media, which had been promulgated as an ordinance by the caretaker government of which I was a part. We expected that the elected government of Nawaz Sharif, which followed, would convert it into an act of parliament in four months. But Mr. Nawaz Sharif was not interested in independent private media. He allowed that ordinance to lapse so that the monopoly of PTV and PBC could continue. So in 1999, when General Musharraf, I knew that he would immediately pass that ordinance because we had discussed it earlier that shouldn't we have media? He said, yes, we should have media. And secondly, why I resigned? I resigned because two reasons. One, I had been constantly telling him, please finalize your exit strategy on which I had given him a paper in May 2000, laying out a time frame and how to go about it. And to my consternation, he did not want to discuss it. Neither did the three generals surrounding him want to discuss that, except to his inf infinite credit, Lieutenant General Ghulam Ahmad, his chief of staff, who tragically and somewhat mysteriously died in a car crash uh, in June, July uh, 2001. <coughs> If General Ghulam Ahmad had lived on, I am confident that many of the decisions that General Musharraf took, negative decisions, would not have happened. Because Ghulam Ahmad was a remarkable, a very balanced individual. But I resigned because of his that. And number two, I heard from some source that Mosouf was wanting me to move to some other ministry. Because he thought information ministry may are, we are not getting enough of a good image. A military government not getting a good image with a free press, what more could you want? He had a very good image. You can't prevent the press from writing some criticism. So I said, if you haven't understood this, no point in staying on. Go uh, Javed, um, I have a very sort of a general uh, kind of a question for you. Both you and I are a little older, I guess, than Pakistan, so we've seen it all. So, so just a tad, huh? So, but obviously you've seen it much closer in, in many ways from your talk and experiences. So the question is, if you had to look back over these 75 years or whatever, where would you place Musharraf? Where do you think history is going to write him? Your, your judgment amongst the leaders that we've had, where do you see him? Top tier, middle tier, bottom tier, we have judgment there because pro con apne bhot de diye, but I want to get the bottom line. That's it. That's quite a in swinger, in swinger, <laughs> very dangerous in swinger. How to rate him? I would rate him in the among the top, the, the top tier but not necessarily uh, uh, right at the top. No, because of those 10 negative things that he did, he would certainly rank amongst uh, the most well-meaning and uh, constructive-minded uh, persons we've had. And also in terms of financial integrity, uh, he may have benefited from the uh, traditional benefits that generals get allotment of plots and so on. But I can vouch for the fact that there was an occasion, I've written about it here, 
there was an occasion where a certain private contractor wanted me to facilitate a meeting with him. And I felt very uneasy, but I just thought, at least let me just tell him. And he had no interest in meeting any private contractor who was interested in selling to the defense forces. And never did I ever find any iota of interest in personal financial uh, corruption or benefit. So that was great credit. Very few people have been of that solid a character. So he would rank in those very top. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, I'm here. My name is Farooq Azam Memon. I am a retired provincial civil servant. <clears throat> Uh, I uh, would like to point out two uh, things which uh, you uh, tried to defend General Musharraf on those. Uh, one was that the elections of 2002. Uh, you said that uh, Zafarullah Khan Jamali could uh, get a majority of just one vote. Possibly, uh, General couldn't manage beyond that or whatever was, was the reason, but the provincial governments in Sindh and Punjab, you must remember here in Sindh, two, two chief ministers, who had almost no standing uh, if left alone, they were made to serve here for more than five years or, five, or, or, or complete their tenure, tenure of five years. Then the other incident was of uh, murder of uh, Akbar Bhukti. Uh, you said the general was, it was not the intent of the general. But the way it was being shown on the national TV, I remember the deputy commissioner of uh, Dera Bhukti perhaps some lassi, Abdul Samadar, I don't exactly remember his name, he was showing the watch of uh, Bakhbar Bukti and some other thing, personal belonging of, of Bukti, in a very, uh, in, a, in a tone which was, uh, I mean, uh, uh, resembling the, uh, that it was from the top of the uh, state uh, thing. So I would like to uh, have your comments on these things. Uh, thank you, sir. But I would want to clarify, it was not the murder of Nawab Bukti. It, it was not fair to call it a murder because it was a military operation to penetrate the cave in which uh, Nawab Bukti had placed himself along with explosives. And senior military officers were asked to go in and persuade him to give up living in that cave and come out, that no harm would come to him. On the face of it, it was a very good plan, but it was a very ill-considered plan as well, because they should have just laid siege to the cave, and ultimately Nawab Bukti would have been obliged to come out. Now, when they stepped in, as I mentioned briefly, there, were, there was an inadvertent explosion caused by someone who fired from within, anticipating that they have come to kill Nawab Bukti. As a result, even army officers were killed in that cave crash. So it was not a targeted soul killing. There were army casualties in that. The way it was handled was so bad, General Mush I was not in government. And that is why it was badly handled. You see, if we are like that, thank God I was not in the government. It would have been a terrible episode to explain. But the way they handled it was very, very crude. It magnified and it distorted the whole incident. Because you remember it had come after that rape incident in Sui Gas, which was also badly handled, where General Musharraf and his government should not have given protection of any kind to a major who was accused. Uh, and they, they tried to cover it up and whatever. So that only aggravated the problem. So, uh, did you have a, s a first question? You said something about... Uh, huh? No, no, yeah, there, certainly there was some manipulation in Sin uh, to ensure that Ar Arbab Rahim became chief minister. Yes, I agree, there was, but not at the poll uh, counting, at the poll casting stage, there was no. There was pre-rigging and there was post-rigging. Uh, even in the National Assembly, 18 PPP MNAs led by Maghdoom Faisal Saleh Hayat, they crossed over. Achha, but incidentally, it is little known that the initiative came from them. This was the surprising thing. They approached the DG Rangers in Lahore to create a channel of communication with Musharraf and GHQ. But anyway, that's part. Thank you.
Uh, with reference to the Nawab of Bhukti, I have something to add here. Um, Nawab Sahib uh, was a good friend of mine. And I remember when Raveen Musharraf took over, three months down the road, or about four months, I was there in Dera Bhukti. So I asked his opinion. And these are Raveen Bhukti's words. Bhot mahul insan lagne. And I got surprised. I'm rather amused. He's a military dictator, and you usually don't have a soft corner for them. Oh, they. Me na to nohne kuch nahi bigar hai. Me na to nohse koi gila hai na koi shikayat hai. Dekhte hai waqt ke saath. And so, if you remember the first roundtable conference General Pradesh Musharraf organized, he was invited, like many other political leaders. Now, I heard this from Abdul Bhukti, and then his family also much later. Uh, he too attended. Roundtable conference. So he goes to now. Dera Bhukti is about 45 minutes an hour drive from Sui, where he has got a guest house. So he went uh, to his guest house early in the morning, and then he'll spend the day. And by noon time, the flight time, he'll just and one can see the uh, airstrip right from Dera Bhukti, uh, not Dera Bhukti, sorry, the Sui guest house. So he was resting there, and he was told by his nephew Heather that uh, the flight takes off at 12. Aap aaram kijiye. Now. Something very interesting. He was told around 10:30 that there okay, was a technical problem in the airline. It was a specially chartered flight for Nawaz sir. So he was told, "Purza hai, sahi ho jayega. We'll an hour late." He said, "Fine, I have no issue. I'm, I'll rest." So at about 12:00 he was told that there was a technical problem and it may take more than a day. So Karachi se purza aayega. I said, "No problem." <coughs> Then he was told that you have to be calm and go. Let's go. I'm going to go back to Dera Bhukti. Nawaz Sahib goes into his 4x4. And as he's leaving for Dera Bhukti, he gets a call from his nephew, Tether, on Thuraya. He works on Thuraya. He works on the satellite phone. Nawaz Sahib, the plane just took off. That was not too exciting for Nawaz Sahib. Nawaz Sahib had a very interesting part. Musharraf sahab, I'll tell you later, as we found out through mutual friends between Pradesh Musharraf and myself, he had no clue what was happening. Probably there were members within the establishment close to Pradesh Musharraf who were orchestrating some kind of a plan that they, the two should not meet. And it probably happened because next time, you know what, Nawaz sahab ek baat hai, to zara usse wale bhi te, to unho ne bhi to leke rakhi hai ke, ke mei saath kya ho hai, kyunki bezati ho bhi. He got even, and how he got even is very funny. So then, I said, Pradesh Musharraf was told that there was no problem. He said, fine, next conference will come. The next RTC will be called again. ADC Paul Nawaz Sahib. Nawaz Sahib said, I will call him from the phone. He said, okay. It was a Ramzan. So, the general sahib has a iftar party. And the round table conference, we will meet the Nawaz Sahib and the Nawaz Sahib and the Nawaz Sahib. Nawaz Sahib said, Nawaz Sahib said, Perhaps the good general doesn't know I'm an agnostic. I don't fast. So, I won't be attending. Thank you. So, I mean, he had some very good feelings for Ved Musharraf. And there were people who worked on it to make sure they don't meet. And those kind of people are still around in establishment. Quite right. No, no, Ami, thank you. Thank you very much for that very interesting <coughs> episode. Because an army, like any other organization, has diverse streams running through it. While on the face of it, it is a single man who commands the army. Under him, there are several interweaving relationships that can contradict each other. And it is not just in Pakistan. It is a, the nature of organizations of that kind uh, have the capacity for these contradictory moves and forward moves that seek to undermine either the top or the base. And you know, that reminds me of the irony that uh, they have something in common. Political parties and the army in Pakistan. They have something very much in common. Both are commanded by single individuals. One is volatile, uneasy, uh, uh, full of the asha, noise and fury, the political party. But all it takes is one guy and one family to control. And even a, a non-family party like the PTI, totally dependent on Imran Khan, right? And we have the army, where the chief of army staff has so much power that he can command not just the army but the other two also. So it's a bizarre situation. And Nawab Bhukti, I had some kind of mixed respect for. Incidentally, I'm revealing a state secret. The gentleman actually sent me a message once saying, 
why don't you become secretary general of the Jamburi Vatan Party, of which he was the chairman. Me, me from Karachi becoming the secretary general of the Jamburi Vatan Party. No, thank you. But uh, he was a remarkable, very complex individual. Nawab, very complex. <coughs> Um, I heard in uh, very keenly whatever you said about the good points and the bad points <laughs> and we happen, both of us, I hope you don't narrate that I live, we live in the same lane. <laughs> <clears throat> what I was really thinking about is that uh, you mentioned some very good points. Uh, Mr. Musharraf and I got along very well and I have the greatest respect for him. I cried a lot when he died, but that's uh, another factor. He was one of the very genuine persons that I've come across in my service. Having said that, uh, you said something as a good point about introducing the local government system. Uh, I have nothing against the local government system. But in the same little act, he abolished the district magistrate and the subdivisional magistrate. Now, because I am privy to that meeting where this was being decided and you know we were called in a meeting. I happened to be Secretary of Local Government at that time. And uh, we were just told this is the thing we were aware and you know uh, we need to just you know introduce this. And this was Mr. Rakhvi. And I told him, sir, you can't do that. And he said, why can't I do that? I said, very simple. You, you just cannot take something from here and just keep it here and that. Just assume that it will work. It cannot. When you are going to transfer 13 subjects of the provincial government at the grassroots level, which includes health and education and excise and taxation, what do you think would happen? Why don't you do a pilot project? Do a pilot project. You are opposing us? I said, not really, but I am just suggesting. And that was Mr. Nakhvi. And by the time I got back, I was transferred. <laughs> uh, but that's another thing. So don't you think that this institution of the district magistrate and this SDM has done away with the little justice system that prevail at the grassroots level. It's very important to understand. The gap is so much. Now where do you go for your small little things? You have to go to the city courts all the time. And then what do you do at the city courts? You keep on paying the advocates. You keep on paying the page cards. What, what actually is happening? I mean, he did do away with that institution. Fair enough. Just because of Mr. Rakhvi's land, had been sold <laughs> by because he wanted to sell it. I mean, that's a fact of life. He wanted to sell it. He sold it through a deputy commissioner, and then the person who bought. I, I hope I'm not taking too long. I'm just you know. Uh, yeah. Can I go on for another minute? So you uh, you you didn't divulge on that. I think that that was something that Mr. Mushar, in my view. Um, I'm a great fan of his and he did everything probably uh, his contribution to the two big projects that he got in turn for giving up something to the Chinese and in lieu thereof he got his two projects the Gawadar and the Tharpur to which I am privy and also I am privy to that meeting when everything was being you know he was being pumped up Mr. Musharraf was being pumped up against Mr. Akbar Kutti. I was in that meeting as a federal secretary. So I know about that. But we don't want to go into that detail. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Aslam. Uh, fine, fine. You are right, you are right. There was no public consultation in General Nami's program of local There was no public consultation, and that is the sad part of most scenes that you just don't talk to the people. You just draw them up and look you over through the 
No, thank you, Aslam Sanjani sir. You are a very respected civil service officer. As Asuma Sahib has rightly said, there is this tendency not to consult. Uh, to be fair to uh, to be fair to the government as a whole, and not because I am connected with it. Before we approved in cabinet the law to introduce independent media, I personally visited all the provincial capitals and convened meetings of all stakeholders, editors, journalists, whatever, to get their views on the new law. But that was probably an exception. Others should have done it. And in this case, I agree, the district magistracy was a very vital component which should not have been done away with. I agree with you. Thank you, sir. I am now going to wind up, please, if you don't mind. I'm going to wind up because we've covered a lot of time. <clears throat> and I want to thank O.K. Khadir because of our friendship. Minister Saab, I still call you a minister but you, because you continue to be respected in that manner. Always. May Allah bless you, give you good health and further opportunities to serve our country. Sir, I want to ask this what were the differences between you and General Musharraf? You have a lot of history, but you have not done any wrong things. What did you do? You resigned. There must be something which really bothered you a lot. Chakkar, Chakkar, Namaskar. The Hindi is the Hindi. Chakkar, Namaskar. Lord Kardinda, Excellency, uh, you probably missed my response. I gave two reasons. One is that willingness to discuss the date for his exit, the exit strategy. That was one, which had been festering and kept building up. And secondly, uh, his decision that because they were, he was not getting a fair press, maybe I should be asked to become uh, the minister for another ministry or become ambassador to a certain major country which he had in mind which I did, was not interested in. I felt <coughs> if you think that the information ministry is not doing a fair job for you, then you obviously need someone else. But I don't agree. I think you are getting excellent coverage <laughs> considering you are a military ruler. What more can you ask for? I appeared on BBC's hard talk and defended it. When you have to defend a military ruler on a BBC show and the questioner had to accept some of the arguments I presented and yet if you are not happy with that or because unfortunately So unfortunately dear Musharraf also was Khan Ka Kacha Some people who might have some other access to grind might have whispered in his ear Sir, you could get a much better deal out of that. And incidentally, the guy will remain nameless, but someone was very desperate to join Musharraf. And today he is in exile from Pakistan, and he raises his voice against military rulers. But at that time, I used to get regular visits from him, asking me to recommend him to General Musharraf, which I did. And then Musharraf and I at least agreed that his presence would in fact damage the country rather than uh, help the government. You've let, let out so many secrets today. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know on how many, in how many instances you have violated the Federation <laughs> Secrets Act. But we forgive you. Because, because this was an excellent session. And listening to you, I was wondering whether I should not also write about my references <laughs> about you have written such a good book already in Pakistan and the age of turbulence. You must read it. Superb. Thank you very much. <coughs> and I will wind up. Thank you very much, Javid. This was an excellent session. I want to thank uh, you on behalf of the members of the audience and on behalf of the Institute. But I would also like to refer <coughs> everyone to a documentary which was made, uh, made by one Mr. Muhammad Ali I don't know if you see it. Inshallah, democracy. 
is called Inshallah the Mountain Sea. <coughs> and in that he writes about Mishada. I found Mishada to be magnanimous, charming, unaffected, and genuinely patriotic. <coughs> At the same time, I found him to be narcissistic, narrow minded, self sabotaging, and insecure at times. So here was your man, you can take it and leave it. We all have our own memories of him, positive and negative, and as uh, David said, rest in peace. Thank you very much, everybody, and please serve the love.